Owner and founder of Western Insights Media and the corresponding affiliation with that Western life culture, Katie Schrock is passionate about promoting the Western industries that are becoming more and more popular in today's mainstream media. Katie's background comes from direct reporting in Oregon legislation on ranching, agriculture, water, and land use issues, and livestock depredation issues throughout the Pacific Northwest. When she's not busy managing or marketing her diverse portfolio of large Western-based events with her company, you can find her working out, reading, hanging with her dogs, raising and processing her own beef and poultry, barrel racing, horseback riding, and raising her first set of sprint horse babies for the track. Please help me welcome Katie to the Ag Chicks podcast. Hey y'all, this is Allie Spears, your host of the Ag Chicks podcast, where I cultivate connections with the women who are helping feed the world. That is hilarious. I don't know. I'm trying to think. I feel like I bought random things by accident in so my mom and I have a like antique and home decor business and um we this actually didn't happen to us but it happened to my boyfriend's stepmom who also has like a business similar to ours but she was bidding in an auction and she didn't realize that what she was bidding on was like a pallet of the object oh so she thought she won five chairs like like the mm-hmm. old school kind of like desk school chairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. She bought five pallets of those <laughs> chairs. Uh, and so that was like, I, after that, my mom and I were like, no more auctions. Like, got to read the fine print. Feel much more ca- comfortable in like cattle auction situations. Um, but cattle yeah, auctions auction are scary. intimidating though. Because like I purchased a show heifer, which was very much like purchasing a horse in an auction where you it's like one item it's got the pedigree yeah. out like all that stuff versus I went to our livestock auction and I was like like I have a TikTok that went kind of viral because I'm just sitting there like don't itch your nose I don't know what's happening yeah. and then someone bought like some cows and I really wanted some of these heifers but I was like I can't afford 17 heifers and this guy bids and bids and bids and then I'm like wow he just paid so much money and he's like I want those four ear tags and they take them out and then they start bidding again and I was like so that was an option. That was an option I could have done. That, that would have been that would have been good to know. But everyone, I was like one of like 10 people there because everyone was bidding online. So I'm just mm-hmm. there looking like a crazy person because I just sat there for like an hour and a half and then was like, okay, I'm just going to go home now without any cows because I don't know what I'm doing. But I, in your defense, I feel like every auction is different too. So uh, like depending on what kind of auction it is, obviously, but then if there's like consigners involved like they can put the specs on you know like okay the the buyer's option of five or ten the yes. rest go back up so in your defense very confusing I will agree I'll with take you. it Cat auctions can be crazy they can be crazy um yeah but same thing we just went to a highland auction actually in Wyoming a few months ago which was really fun and interesting have never been to a highland auction but my mom was like really wanted this heifer and the guy kept looking at me and I thought he thought I was bidding. And so I panicked because I was like, I'm not bidding. Like I'm not bidding on this heifer. And it was at like a crazy amount. And then I look over my mom's like this and I'm like, Oh my God, stop looking at her. Like (laughs) my, but my first horse that I bought in an auction, uh, it was during an ice storm. We live close to the auction yard here in Oregon. And so my sister and I went down there to look at some ponies. It was in February went to look at some ponies for some friends who had kind of been keeping an eye out around the Christmas time era for, for a pony for their kids. There's a bunch of ponies going through. So we went to look at them. We had a chain up for the full, typically it's like a 35 minute drive. It took us like three hours, two and a half hours to get there. Oh my There's this beautiful horse there as before they had the online auction in 2017. And they had this bid for this horse and it was like 800 bucks, a thousand bucks, like 1200. Would someone go 1500 going once? going twice I had no number no nothing I just stood up and was like me (laughs) anyway we ended up getting her and uh, that's my mere fortune for anyone who follows me on social media who's the mother of Ariel my two-year-old and it's about to full as of this recording is about to full like any moment so pretty excited well that's exciting um yeah super exciting crazy auction stories I feel like everyone has in the ag industry pretty much everyone has like a crazy auction story of some sort um 
But Katie, super excited to have you on today and get to know a little bit more about you and kind of all the crazy things that you have going on, because I know you have a very full plate. Um, so I just appreciate you taking some time to chat with me kind of first off and looking forward to spending the next couple, uh, not couple minutes, but a few minutes with you and, and sharing with my audience kind of what makes you Katie, I guess. Well, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And I listened to a couple episodes kind of getting ready for everything. I'm literally the worst at listening to podcasts, even though I have a podcast. And I was laughing because on one of your episodes, when you started it, you're like someone who is just as many things going on as I do. And I was like, oh, I'm noticing a theme. Like this is the podcast for me. We all have a lot going on. Yes, for sure. Yeah. If you are um, want to feel better about having a full plate, definitely listen to Ag Chicks because pretty much everyone has a lot going on. Um, and yeah, that makes me feel better because I feel like half the time my friends and family are like, you're insane. You're adding what? Like you're doing what? Um, but people, people don't get it, especially if they're not from the ag world. I think in the ag world, we're so used to it because so much income has to come from off farm that we're so used to at least one or two people in a family household working outside the farm, as well as working on the farm, as well as trying to find other like forms of revenue. So I feel like it's just kind of like pre-built into you from the 4-H FFA eras to be that way. And maybe I'm wrong, but I know it's very few friends of mine <clears throat> that are that into like a bunch of different things uh, when it comes to stuff that aren't ag, like most of them are ag related, which I think is really interesting on like a behavioral economic side of things. No, super, super interesting. And I couldn't agree more. I think there's just like a inherent um, like characteristic that people in ag have of just like, I got to keep going, got to, got to, kind of look for an angle here, look for an angle there of uh, of doing things. But speaking on kind of families, on farms and all that, where where did you grow up, I guess, is my first question. And were, was your family involved in agriculture or was that something that you kind of have evolved into? I actually came from a multi-generational farm of sorts, not in the way okay. that like when people normally hear that, they think like, oh, we've been on the same plot of land, farming the same thing for generation after generation. What I mean is that everybody in my family has in some capacity been a farmer or rancher for three generations now on both sides. And so for me, I grew up in Corvallis, Oregon, which is home of Oregon State University. And my dad, while well, he hobby farms is what we call it. I mean, he does turn a small profit, but it's like to stay in tune to his roots actually as an entrepreneur in road construction. And then he also is a provider, a service provider for farmers. He is an aerial applicator, AKA a crop duster. Oh. So my parents have a registered airport in their backyard and they fly out of it most of the spring, summer, fall, uh, taking care of a lot of the hazelnuts, grass seed, et cetera, Christmas trees, everything up here in the Northwest uh, that, that they can help with. So that's kind of like country adjacent on that. And uh, I really enjoy it. And we've had like my grandpa on my dad's side had cattle, grandpa on my mom's side had chickens and turkeys. And so you can kind of see that kind of skipped a generation is my joke. Cause I'm not quite a third generation chicken farmer, but I'm pretty close to that as well as cattle. Awesome. And I think uh, the crop duster industry, I guess, is for lack of a better term, which it is, it is an industry or career path, um, is something that is not talked about enough, I feel like, in agriculture, but it's such a vital part of everything that goes on in terms of crops and um, kind of crop health and, and keeping diseases out and stuff. And also, crop dusters, I think they are insane because of how close they have to get to the ground without crashing, obviously, um, and how fast they go and just kind of all the different maneuvers that they do. They That is a really like high level job to be involved in because it's um, they're so important and they, they do some crazy stuff in the air that I would not feel comfortable doing. Well, to put it in perspective, for those of you listening who aren't super familiar, my dad used to be a uh, aerial acrobatist and like would go to the plane races and stuff. So that puts it a little bit in perspective. And I feel like crop dusters are the mainland version or like the lower 48th version of a bush pilot up in Alaska. Like they're going to be a little bit crazy. Like when I tell people like, oh, like my dad does like all this cool stuff and he's kind of an adrenaline junkie in that. He's also afraid of heights. So don't ask why he's a pilot, but he flies under power lines. Like that is how low to the ground they're going. So if you can picture that, it gets pretty exciting um, that they have to be up to date on all the pesticides, insecticides. They work with the Department of Ag. And the reason that like crop dusting was a great option for him is he already had his pilot's license. He already was a mm -hmm. farmer. He was already aware. Uh, he does road construction as well. So he built his uh, airport that he has. So it's been pretty 
pretty cool to see all of it come to fruition over the last 25 years or so. But with that being said, uh, it gets really wet up here. So it's hard to get spray buggies out into fields. So that's why the aerial applicators are really good. Obviously you can't spray if there's standing water, but it doesn't take much to sink a couple feet deep and get a buggy stuck in some mud up here. Yeah, for sure. And I know uh, kind of where I'm from, similar, although California, you never know if it's going to be super wet or super dry. But we, when crop dusters would kind of come in the fields around us and our fields, um, that was kind of the similar similar problem is they needed to use um, crop dusters so that they could get in and out of the fields. Um, but yeah, no, such a cool, such a cool career and just kind of different aspect of the industry that people don't think about. So yeah. growing growing up and all of that, did you know that you would want to be connected to ag as you got older or not so much? I think if you'd asked me, I would have said, like, I would have said I wanted to be, I wanted horses in my life in some capacity. I wanted cattle in my life in some capacity. And I knew that at a young age, even though I didn't get my first show steer until I was 14 or 15 years old. But I knew it like as young as eight, like my artwork of future home had like a dog house, the beef barn, the dairy barn, which I'm not doing dairy. You'll never convince me to do that one. But it was really interesting for me because my first passion was actually basketball. And with that, my mom actually talked to a sports psychologist because I was obsessive as a child. Like I watched the coach K from Duke a coaching video every single day after half day kindergarten, I would go outside and play for four hours straight. Like it was a problem. And so the psychologist was like, find something else that will like split her time in an off season. And that solution was horses and quickly fell in love with a small miniature horse named dude that I would drive everywhere got caught riding him one too many times. So when I was eight, we got our first full-size horse and the rest was kind of history. I learned a lot with those two horses, um, love them dearly, lost them just a couple years ago. So super blessed to have a long career with them, but I ended up going to, uh, play college basketball. And what's really interesting is even then, like, I never would have said like, Oh, I'm going to be a farmer. Oh, I'm going to be a rancher, which I still don't even claim that title now. Cause it's just like my side passion. But with that being said, I did reread my college basketball bio and I talked a lot about connecting my fellow student athletes with local producers. That was a very important food is always an important thing for me. Um, And with that, with all of that, I remember even giving presentations to our entire student athlete body, uh, introducing ranchers and how it was more economical for houses of football players to buy a half a beef than to go to the store and get it. And so we really started connecting farmers and ranchers really early, I guess you could say. And then about my sophomore, junior year of college, that is what became my passion as an agricultural business management major. And at the time I was minoring and then looked into doubling in new media communications, trying to make mm-hmm. everything in my ag business classes, new media focused. So if I did something in ag, I wouldn't want it media focused. It would annoy everybody. Then I'd flip over to my new media classes, which were not agricultural kids at all. And I would try to make them ag based, like whatever media project I had, I wanted it to be media based or every media project, make it ag based. And Mm -hmm. vice versa. And then keep in mind at this point, I'm dressed as an athlete with ice bags on me in all these classes. So I didn't fit in in any norm, I guess you could say. So that is one thing that I felt like I kind of got this great opportunity to build this Venn diagram of friend circles that were like tech people, media people, agricultural business management people, and then the athlete community as well, which just created this beautiful storm, I guess you could say. Yeah, no, it's always interesting to me to hear about kind of what people studied in college and like how that kind of led that to where they're at because sometimes it connects sometimes it doesn't uh, but also hearing when people say like they didn't really know like kind of the direction they were headed in but they can look back and see like oh I actually had it like in my bio yeah. or whatever you could see before, it yeah yeah before you even realize it that stuff always kind of intrigues me because I feel like personally I can definitely relate to that I feel like I was doing things early on for like connecting to consumers without even really, really realizing it. And so um, I was also a business major. And so I can relate to you on that, but I don't know if I would have been an ag business major, like looking back, if I would have known what I know now about where life would lead me. However, I am also a big uh, proponent of you need to have some business knowledge. I think if you're going to be in the entrepreneurial space, it definitely helps. Not that you can't figure it out, but it definitely has a little, has helped to have some background and all of that stuff. Um, and it's just impl- applicable to kind of so many different things too. But um, so you went to college, 
had all of that stuff going on while being a student athlete. Um, and then when you graduated, what was kind of the next step? Was that when you started your business or kind of what were the steps that followed after that? Well, I actually suffered a bunch of injuries and I tore my right shoulder, um, ended up doing it twice. So right shoulder, left shoulder, oh. right shoulder again. And then I got runner's IT band, which is basically your IT bands aren't long enough for your body. So I actually ended up in a wheelchair for a day, one day. That was the worst experience of my life. I couldn't get around. So I went back to crutches, which was still equally as awful, uh, living in a college townhouse. And yeah. it scared me. Like, I remember being like, I don't like, I'm 22 years old and I have like when you're playing division one college basketball, you're working out six hours a day plus three hours of film. Oh yeah. By the way, throw in class. So yeah. with that being said, like I was very much, I had like identity issues, I guess you could say, but there is one thing you can do when you can't walk often. And that is ride a horse. And so for me to want to go do something or to move, I had founded a Northwest pro rodeo association competition, rodeo drill team. And so I just started really leaning into that and then riding more and really enjoying it. And so trying to finish up school, like my last year, I was working 110 hours of pay period at the hotel and I worked everything from cooking on the line to like room inspecting, to front desk, to sales, like whatever I could do to get the hours, as most people know, trying to get the money to pay for school and to pay for rent and food. And that was a very humbling, humbling time. Like you learn a lot. And I remember, I always tell people that I'm a big psychological person. Like when it comes to understanding things, um, like right now I'm pretty obsessed with behavioral economics, but looking back at it, I remember I would just tell people I'd be so cheerful. I would just be like, Oh, like I worked from 6 AM to 2 PM. I had a two hour break. I got called in for night shifts. So then I worked from 9 PM back to 6 AM. Oh yeah. I stayed later because that person didn't show up. And people were like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, every great story has this moment where you're just digging through the weeds and they're like, I'm like, I'm like writing the story right now. And I was just so excited. And just like that, like enthusiasm and optimism, I think is really what's carried me through a lot. Uh, but in the process of that, uh, my last year of basketball, uh, going into or that first year, not playing basketball, my older sister, Nicole was the 2013 Miss Rodeo Oregon and cool, coolest kid on the block. She was featured in Cosmo magazine as the runway model who rides horses. And it was just a really exciting time because this Cosmo reporter named Kelly and her photographer, Gabby, can fold the whole family around. That was my first real segue into mainstream, like national media, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, I came back from the Miss Rodeo America pageant after my sister competed, which I tell everybody that I almost vomited and passed out during the crowning because it was the most stressful thing. I was like, I can handle Stanford women's basketball. I can't handle crowning at Miss Rodeo America. This is the worst thing ever. And I came back and my professor of propaganda, actually, propaganda communications, Dr. Iltis, who just passed away a couple years ago, he sat me down because I was going to take my final later because I had, I wanted to go to the Miss Rodeo America pageant and he had been gracious enough to let me do that. And he had actually been the mentor for the only Miss Rodeo America to hold the crown from Oregon, which was from 2012. And he was like, why don't you be a Miss Rodeo Oregon? And I kind of looked at him like he was crazy. And I was like, cause I can ride and I can talk. And he was like, I know, but like, think how cool this could be. And that's nothing against rodeo Queens. I was just the biggest hater of rodeo Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, I still have some questions about things, um, <laughs> but with his prompting, he actually just voided my whole final. He said, I'll give you the grades you got. Now we went to the whiteboard and we write all these things. He's like, what do you want to do in your life? And I was like, I don't know. And it's like the first time someone really sat down, we covered this whiteboard and I still have whiteboards all over my house. Um, you can't see them. They're off screen, but we went through this whole process and he had me circle things of like, what would be helped if I was Miss Rodeo Oregon? What would never happen if I was Miss Rodeo Oregon and what would be delayed. And there was nothing that was crossed off the list if I did it. But one thing that was super lucrative on there was the scholarship opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so um, I always joke that on a whim, but it, it wasn't a whim. I'd help my sister study for four or five different rodeo titles and other people as well for the last like six or seven years. And basically just went for it. And I became the first Miss Rodeo Oregon to ever win the title without holding a previous title. And that was for over 30 years. And my sister and I became the first wow. sisters to both hold the title. So I won the title Miss Rodeo Oregon. So that's kind of how the end kind of shook out there. Um, I was really blessed because I got to work with uh, the local Wilco co-op co store here. It's like a retail farm store. I got to work in their retail department seasonally. Um, I had worked for them as an internship in the media department when I was in college. So they helped out with kind of offset of costs as being Miss Rodeo Oregon. And then they got offered a job in March of my Miss Rodeo Oregon year. 
And to keep in mind, most state rodeo queens don't hold a job. So for me, I'd done it to get a job. And I was like, I want to be a communications person. Well, by March, I got a call to go to the Capitol and I became the communications director and events management coordinator for the Oregon Cattlemen's Association, which at the time was the five-time reigning agricultural commodity of the year for the state of Oregon. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, I'm spending four days a week in the Capitol, like lobbying, writing magazines, like editing things, doing all this content. And then boom, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm in big hair, a hat, a crown on a horse at a rodeo. And it was probably the biggest whirlwind because I remember when I got to the Minnesota America pageant, the director of agricultural or the dean of agricultural sciences, I believe is at Mississippi State University was one of our judges. And he was like, I, I'm really confused. I did some Googling. He's like, you're not the registered lobbyist. And like, you're not this person too, are you? Like, it's the same name, but it's not you, is it? And I was like, no, that's me, like in my day job. <laughs> so um, that's kind of the tra- like the transition that I went there. And I feel like I kind of came out of a cannonball and I was just along for the ride and doing the best that I could to network with everyone I could meet, learn as much as possible. I mean, I slept in my office because it was a 45 minute commute one way. I would sleep in my office more nights than not because I couldn't even make it back home in time to turn around to come right back to be there for a 6 a.m. meeting. So you just kind of grind it out right in the story. Yeah, and I think that's another thing kind of, first of all, that's incredible. That's an incredible kind of uh, founding story, I guess you could say, for everything that you um, have done and are currently doing. Uh, But I think going back to our conversation about kind of that just like grind mentality I think obviously I I have a belief that that does come from being involved in agriculture and seeing people around us involved in agriculture and kind of have to have that grinding mentality but I also think it's something that's really rare uh just in kind of like our generation but I will say I think women in our generation who have that connection to agriculture are I don't, this is maybe like a cheesy way to say it, but like they're unstoppable because they have that ability to just like put their head down and do it. And like we mentioned earlier, a lot of people do not understand that or they don't see the end goal like we do, but we're just like, hey, I have a I have a goal I'm trying to meet and I just got to do everything possible to get to that point. And so it always makes me feel better when I hear other stories like that because somebody else gets it and um and really at the end of the day, we only have each other to kind of lean on in terms of our insanity or sanity, I guess you could say either way. Absolutely. And I think too, I always make this comment. I I believe everything's a mindset thing. And that's something I learned a lot in college because, you know, you turn your shoulder, like I, I had no idea how to work computer. I didn't have any social media, nothing until after college, which is weird because like, even for my age, I'm 32, most of my age, People had Facebook, MySpace, et cetera. In high school, I didn't have any of that. And for me, I leaned into media because when I tore my shoulder, immediately recognized that I was not going to get to travel with the basketball team. So all I could think was, how can I provide value in such a way that they can't afford to not take me? And I was Mm. like, well, they're not going to let me like help coach. That'd be like crazy. They have actual coaches for that. And so I pitched to our state newspaper and said, hey, can I write a column on the road with the women's basketball team? They were like, absolutely. So I'm like, hi, sorry, I have to be there. I'm the reporter. Got my arm in a sling. I remember my coach saying, are you even gonna be able to write? And I'm like, yeah, I got really fast at typing with just my left hand. And then from there, I got this little flip cam and started making those videos. And we went to the uh, final or the elite eight for the WNIT that year. And so it was just so fun because the only footage, we didn't have a... SID, like the sports information director shooting photo video. So that was kind of like my segue in, I guess you could say, because I remember a lot of people were like, oh, you have a lot of followers like before you were these things. And I was like, actually, no, like I basically made my account for Miss Rodeo Oregon to promote my sponsors because I wanted to treat it as a business. And it all, I guess it all worked out. Like that's a big part of it too, is that when you think of the mindset behind like just making the most out of any situation, there's this thing in basketball, like when you play, that's like go 110% because even if you're wrong, at least you'll get something out of it. Like, even if you don't know what the play is or don't know what defense you're in, just go 110% because that's going to be a lot better for you in the long run than if you just don't do anything. 
And they always think of that too. Like whatever you're in, go 110%. Like if you go to an event that you don't want, just go 110% in meeting people, networking, and really being present. Like don't be that person standing in the corner because you never know who you might meet. And you never know how that could change the trajectory of your life in just that moment. Yeah, and you exactly. And you never know how maybe someone you met and then even six months down the road, you get a phone call and they have an opportunity for you because of that interaction. And so, um, yeah, I think that's all fantastic advice and, and such a just kind of cool story of how things evolved for you. So uh, played basketball, you were doing the um, uh, Rodeo Queen situation and then lobbying. So what did like what kind of happened after your reign i guess you could say and um did you continue on with the lobbying or what kind of happened after that yeah so that's when i really leaned into cattlemen's things and like full transparency and i actually talk about this a lot i remember so i was making just under thirty thousand dollars salary and i was working 90 plus hours i think a week like it was it was, like I said, you know, I was sleeping in my office. I had a change of clothes in a closet and I would just go change and just like, oh, you're here early. Oh yeah. You know, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Um, but we actually, our entire staff left on a whistleblower policy. So that was kind of a rude awakening at about 25 years old or 24 years old of just like how bad things can get in places. Right. And yeah. it was really hard because we all left and all my other fellow colleagues had uh, husbands or family businesses and they were like, oh, we'll lean on this. And I'm like, they can't live without us. Like we do everything like duh jokes on me. They could live without us. And at the time I remember being just heartbroken. Cause I remember my boss being like, if you want to make 32, that's what I asked. $32,000 a year is what I asked for. So he said, if you want to make $32,000 a year, he just started laughing. He's like, you're going to have to go somewhere. No one's going to pay a girl to pay that much money. And I was like, and then for some reason, I'm going to make jokes about this like randomly, but the truth is, I think he just like spurred on this entrepreneurial hate fire, right? Like the competitor in me was like, okay, but like, mm -hmm. let's do this. And so it's just really interesting, like how that kind of all manifested because I started looking at jobs everywhere. I'm desperate. Like I was part of the 11% in the country because I looked up the stats at the time that had left my job without having a job lined up. I didn't have a husband. I didn't have a family business to go to like truly had bills. And I'm like, I have two months worth of emergency funds, which is why you have those. Um, but what am I going to do? And so I started randomly picking up these like freelance contracts, I guess is what they were. I had done some influencer work as Miss Rodeo Oregon. So I kind of just sent some pitches. I did some influencer things, ran some different clinics, um, just was like whatever I could to make ends meet. And my family was great. I moved back home during this time. My family was great letting me do that. And then eventually after about four months, I looked at it and went, I just matched my old salary. Maybe I should just do this. And so that's why January 1st went ahead and not only started our podcast, That Western Life, but then started my business too. And uh, we just had a, had the most amazing time over the last five, six years now, I guess you could say six years of business, uh, just super blessed, a lot of learning curves, taxes are super, super hard as an entrepreneur. Um, that's like my nemesis. But with that being said, like everything we've gotten to do in me, like I always almost feel guilty and people like my friends complain about their jobs. And I'm like, I have no complaints. Like, yes, I work a lot and I do a lot of random things, but like, I'm so blessed. Like, I don't have a single thing to complain about. Knock on wood. I am just overjoyed to go to work every day. I can't wait for Monday. I don't let myself work on Sundays more than two hours. I'm a workaholic, as you can tell. So I like, I can't wait for Monday morning. Like, I'm out of bed at like 4.45 AM. Like, oh, I'll turn on the computer. Let's go. Like kind of thing. So I'm just super blessed with that. And we've just had so much growth again, met so many people involved with so many organizations, uh, and then getting to be inducted into the 30 under 30 program with Cowgirl magazine has been a huge component of that because especially after COVID and I was inducted during the COVID years, 2021. So you're kind of isolated and boom, I just got to meet this amazing community of women that were all driven. So after a time where I'm with all these people that are kind of burnt out, they don't know what's happening with the job market the pandemic's hitting people pretty hard. All of a sudden, boom, here comes this community, like enter stage left, this amazing community of women that are all like-minded and truly like, if I ever have any problems, I just like post in our group. I just text a large 
group text um, because those women can solve literally any, any, any problem in the world. By ranchers for ranchers, together let's make ranching easier. Previously known as Cattle Back Box, Strayhorn has rebranded to better match their ability to push the envelope in creating innovative animal management products to serve the ranching community. Strayhorn is rooted in tradition and ranching legacy, but they believe in the opportunity of looking at things with a new perspective to drive the industry forward. Check out all of the things that Strayhorn has to offer you and your herd. No, I totally agree. I think uh, that opportunity, I can relate to that in terms of, um, I feel like, and I had just had this conversation with someone else. Uh, I mean, I have a lot of friends. I have a lot of great friends, but I feel like the space that I'm currently in, it's hard to relate to other women in my age who are not kind of in this same space of grinding things out. But five seconds on the uh, group Facebook page or in a group chat, like you're like, okay, cool. Like we're all good. We're all going to be fine. Like we're all working towards things that are going to mean something. Um, it's just been an incredible group of women and such a motivating kind of thing to have to, to lean on. Um, found some really great friends through there. Some really yeah. great podcast guests, of course. <laughs> some of my, uh, some yeah. of my best friends now, like best business friends all come from there. And like, when someone asks me, they're like, what's the trust level? Or like, what's the, cause don't you guys, don't some of you guys compete with each other? And I'm like, no joke. I downloaded my financials of the last four years and sent them to one of them to get their recommendations on hiring processes. And they're like, you sent them your, P I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Not even, didn't even bad night. I was like, here you go. Because the thing is I do trust them. I trust the people I work with and know from this group that highly. And it's just a, it's crazy too, because they're also and maybe this is like a more of a mindset thing. Some of my best friends, and this freaks people out. So I'd love to know your take on this. Uh, some of my best friends are people that in another group chat, people talked bad about like, oh, look at her trying to do blah, blah, blah. And I said, hmm, okay. And then I like DM them and like, you want to get coffee virtually? And like now some of those people have become like my best friends, employees, subcontractors, et cetera. Because the thing is, I'm like, I just recognize that like, usually this comes from a place of threatening. And if you're threatening, that means you're doing something right to an extent. So I always lean into that. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not threatened by people because I feel like if you want a six foot basketball player from Oregon, who also has cattle and butchers her own chickens, like I'm probably the only person you're going to find. So I'm not really worried. Like, I don't know, we're all a unique individual person. And so it's not really like, there's plenty of stuff out there for us, plenty of space. No, for sure. And I can, I can relate to that as well because people, like you said, people are intimidated by others that they like can't fit into the box that makes sense for them. And so, um, yeah, but that, I think that's what keeps our industry moving forward is the out of the box thinkers and people who are willing to kind of take those risks. Um, but then also kind of going back to, you know, trusting people in that group, for me, it's been a really great resource to like, hey, I don't know anything about this, but I can guarantee someone in this group does, or they know someone who mm -hmm. can point me in the right direction. And that's been another kind of great source of guidance, I guess. And when I'm feeling like I'm in the trenches sometimes. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and that's the thing too, is everyone knows everyone, if that makes sense. So yep. my joke is that I try to meet as many people as possible because I want to do I want to have as many one degree of separations from the next person as I possibly can. And that's just, it just served me super well, whether it's on the athletics, I still lean very heavily into my athletic side of things. I have a lot of friends who play professional sports now and being able to watch what they're doing in mainstream sports and pop culture for media and kind of build the strategies for the ag world. That's kind of where I've built my cup of tea, I guess you could say, is mm -hmm. building strategic plans off of pop culture, but seeing how we can relate it to ag culture in a better way or the Western industry. And, and they work mostly in like rodeo and ranching things. So when I say ag culture, I don't really do like row crop stuff specifically, but it's always closely in time. So speaking of your business, I know we kind of talked about how it evolves and kind of a uh, big picture, but what exactly if someone's listening and they're like, wow, love Katie, how do I, how do I uh, work with her? What are some of the services that you guys provide and uh, help people with? Yeah. Thank you for this question. It's always, 
weird because I never promote my business. Like I don't have a Instagram page. I do have a Facebook page, but like I post on it once a year, which is so funny for a marketing company that I don't right. even market ourselves. But most of that has to do with bandwidth most of the time. So if you're listening to this and for whatever reason you are like, like, oh my gosh, I just want to be around Katie, which would be so cool. But um, we actually are hiring right now. So if you want to head over to westerninsightsmedia.com forward slash careers, we're looking for a sponsorship acquisition executive. So that's kind of a cool, fun little project that we have going there. The best way that I describe my company, uh, we're basically a fractional CMO or chief marketing officer. So for large Western based events or associations or organizations that don't have the budget necessarily for their own in-house marketing team, whether that is because you don't, you're not busy year round or because you just don't have enough work to justify that human labor and employment. Um, we're the people you call to come in. So we can do everything from as small quotes around small, <laughs> small as like marketing strategy, event planning, things like that, all the way through like handling all aspects of it from like your social to your press releases, to your billboards, Facebook ads, Google ads, Google, my business, radio commercials, TV commercials, so on and so forth. Um, and like I said, we do large Western based events. So it's kind of our sweet spot. Um, we have a, well, the second largest country music festival in the Pacific Northwest. So we work with some of the biggest artist names in the country, which then kind of aligns us out to working with them at other events as well. We also have a rodeo in our portfolio with the PRCA. It's one of the biggest ones here in Oregon. So we work with that one pretty closely. There, what I love a lot is that when I first started, a lot of companies were very micromanaged and said, only do this or only do that. And it's been so fun with these clients that I've been with for a couple of years. Cause at this point I can, I throw out like some random things and they're fully on board. So our music festival, we threw out a marketing campaign to bring in younger generation. After COVID, we lost a lot of our long-term fan base of over 30 years, just because people weren't as comfortable going out into big masses of 12,000 people or so. And we kicked off the largest country Western line dancing and swing dancing competition on the West coast. And that has been super fun. It has taken off. We've gotten pitches from Netflix and a couple other places. It's like Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders making the team. Our stomp Peters is what they're called. So check them out are beyond amazing. My director of dance, Kat Nichols Newcomb, she is phenomenal. So like I said, we have all these different things going on. We also help with uh Calgary magazine's 30 under 30 awards down in Texas. If you guys never check that out, please check that out. And we also do a bunch of other like one-off events um, from barbecue competitions to brew fest, um, a lot of country music, county fairs, uh, you name it. It's just been, it's been super fun. And then uh, kind of how we keep ourselves up to date with today's news and information. We have the That Western Life community, which is our podcasting educational arm, I guess you could say. And then well, I guess shouldn't totally say educational. We also have the digital ag Academy, uh, which is online courses as well. So we do have like a rodeo queen course that we do with Kate Cox and we have, um, I'm doing a specific one this year. So if you're a rodeo queen listening to this, I'm actually going to dump a course out. That is everything. I wish I would have known sponsorship and marketing when I was a rodeo queen. And just from what I've done on the rodeo side now from administration, it's like how you can put all of that together into being like pretty much the ultimate powerhouse. So that'll be coming out as well. And then um, we also have an influencer man management course. So we run a pretty large influencer team and that's been really beneficial for us. And so we actually did that for a festival and event association to help them out with some things. And, uh, you know, super blessed. We've won festival of the year, rodeo of the year, marketing campaigns of the year, and uh, just kind of look to grow in a, in a new year and bring more people onto the team. Right now I have a phenomenal, I have to give her a shout out. Emily Cole is my executive assistant and she is literally fantastic and she keeps my head on a platter. Like literally sometimes I text her and tell her to tell me what to do for the day so that I can keep things organized. And she does that. So hopefully that wasn't too long winded, but that's Western insights media for you. And, and that Western life. No, that's fantastic. Holy cow. How many people do you have on your team? Uh, Emily and I, and whoever wants to be a sponsorship acquisition director. <laughs> Holy cow. How do you keep all of that moving? Um, okay. So well, there's actually, there actually is a way there. I have an algorithm. There's this is like actually a very well, this is a Malcolm Gladwell answer for you. I'll make okay. it as short as possible in basketball. Our college coach made something called an efficiency rating. It's okay. all the good divided by all the bad. And you would exponent like whatever. I don't even know if that's a verb. I just made it a verb exponent. Whatever Sounds good. you thought was good. So like every 
point you make plus two times every offensive rebound plus one time every okay. defensive round rebound plus four times every block divided by 10 times any technical fouls times, you know, whatever. So you get a sufficiency rating. So you would know that like a post who's going to be shooting shots closer to the basket is going to be a higher number. So your posts are going to be like a 1.35 to like a 1.5. But if then your guards who are going to be maybe passing the ball, checking at the court, things like that are probably going to be like a 0.8. So okay. with that being said, what would happen in like playoff situations where you're playing teams back to back, like a tournament, someone would check in and our coach would be like, that's our point. That's our point. She's a, she's a 0.5. That would probably mean that she's either a really bad shot, no offense, or it's an invisible person, or um, they're going to turn the ball over. So put some pressure on them. Okay. Right. So it was this way of just instantly grabbing it. So Back when I worked at the Cattlemen's, in order to keep up, I had the magazine, all the digitals, and 17 events a year, political action fun, and then watching the legislative session, short or long, depending on the year, and then writing all the copy, connecting with our ranchers to get them to come in to testify, so on and so forth. So I started this list that started by hand with a highlighter and has now progressed to being a fully interactive spreadsheet, and I call okay. it my efficiency planner. So I break down all my categories per client in SKU numbers. Here comes the retail side from working at Wilco. I have SKU okay. numbers for every client. There is four parts to each client. So four points, three points, two points, and one point. I have a little diagram. It's like, is it going to move the financial needle? And is it time sensitive? That's four points, three points, two points, one point. Right. So you put all of them in there. So you take all of your tasks to do divided by how many points you get a day. And so I can tell you how efficient I am every single day, every day of the week, every week of the month, every month of the year, every quarter of the year, to the point that when people reach out and say, Hey, like, can we be a client? Our events this time of year, I can pull up five years worth of data and say, Ooh, that's actually a really busy time of year for us. Cause I can tell by the efficiency rating, but if they're not, it's also color coded. So I'm like, Oh, that's in the yellow. So we'd really have to look at what the time looks like and how much you're going to put into it versus the red, I'm going to be like, ah, oh, that's probably just not a good time for us, unfortunately, but we can refer you to some other people. If it's green, put it in. And so I have an entire efficiency list on it and I shoot to have 120% efficiency. It's like a 1.2, try to be a good post every day, <laughs> even though I was a shooting guard. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. I have it all broken down. I have like podcasts. I even, I really trying to get really good at financial literacy and economic literacy. So I have a whole section there. I am in taking, I always take a course. So I have my course in there. Um, and then I have every single client. So from our Bucking Horse Association to the rodeo, to the music festival, to the dance team, Cowgirl 911, Cowgirl 30 under 30, like they're all in there. And it's a whole, it's a whole thing. And then I, yeah, like I said, I will answer, I have a whole Malcolm Gladwell answer for you on that one. I actually have like a rhyme and reason to make it happen. And then do you like, segregate your time based off of like your point system is that how that works for you yes yeah, so then you're really gonna laugh at this so I have like my actual like a day planner right and okay. so what I do is I it sub it like does many tallies of how many points per section so I time block 190 minute 160 minute and 130 minute guarantee per day okay that's not just counting other stuff um and so what I do from there is I take wh whichever block has the most points in it. When the day starts, they get 90 minutes. Then the next one gets 60 and the next one gets 30. And so within a, within the week, they'll all rotate around. Right. And anything time sensitive goes at the top of that list, obviously, but that's pretty much how we, we rock and roll with the list so far. It's been working pretty good. Like at some point, everyone's like, you need to make an app or like something for this. But I think there's also something to it too, that every day I write every piece down. I definitely um, am ADHD. So that if it's out of sight, I will forget it. It's not personal. I will just straight forget it. So I have to make sure everything is on the to-do list. And this is just the best way that I've found of keeping it there. If you wear multiple hats, people like my friends who use this are obsessed with it. But if you only do like one job and there's like one, like one thing that you do at the job, like you're not just, I don't, that's not just, yeah, no. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're just doing event management for your company, like, and there's one event a year, like whatever, you know, like this is probably overwhelming. And so those friends who have used it have actually used it for the entire week. So they just take one efficiency rating for the week versus per day. 
So there is some ways to do it, but that's what I think drives me. Cause even if I'm having a bad day, this has happened. Like I'm having a bad day and I just don't feel like my energy is there. And I'm just kind of on a low weather's super bad. I will go through that list and be like, okay, I need 20 more points. So let's find five, four pointers and let's just get this done. So, and I also do this thing on Friday. I gamify everything. So like on Fridays, I start the day out with like a 60 minute, like power hour, <laughs> I guess you could say, yeah. which is, I do as many of the little things as I possibly can just like shoot them off the list on the Friday. And so I'm like, ah. Oh. And then I get my protein coffee and I'm very happy. Okay. I'm going to need you to, I got to get that spreadsheet. You want somehow. a copy? Oh, yes. I'll let it do you. <laughs> that is, first of all, very straightforward. It makes so much sense. Uh, I'm extremely competitive, but I often find myself having 7,000 things on my to-do list. And like, I don't really know where to start. And I try to go through and prioritize. And then that stresses me out more. So this is, you may have just fixed my life, Katie. <laughs> it it definitely helps. And it's so funny too, because I always make this joke because we're doing this history series in our podcast. And it's like the echoes of rodeo, which are like the different cultures that make up rodeo. And oh, every cool. single culture so far that we've read has been like, they invented rodeo. And I'm like, I literally wrote down, I was like, hey, did we all invent rodeo at the same time? So therefore we all try to take claims to it. And so it fits this spreadsheet and this efficiency list though, because I came up with those four components to be able to determine what color to highlight that little item. And after I did it, then I realized that like years later, that president Hoover I, or Eisenhower maybe has like the four point checklist for to-do lists. And I was like, it's like the same thing. And I was like, I... I really thought I was on to something. You brought it back. You brought it yeah, back. I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And that's, yeah, I really think you just changed my life there. So um, after this podcast, wow. I'll show you, I'll show it to you. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, but okay. So, wow. I, I feel <laughs> out of breath because you have so much going on, but I, I, I can relate to it as well. Um, and and you are doing such a fantastic job. I mean, everyone that I know, also you know everybody. Everyone's like, oh, have you, do you know do you know Katie? Do you know Katie? And I'm like, I do, but we've never actually spoken. So everyone, I'm excited. Listening, we, this is our our first um, virtual yet speaking interaction, I guess you could say. Uh, yeah. But but you know everyone, so you're doing something right for sure, and you have a great reputation in the industry. Uh, I think your work probably is speaking for itself and, and not only upholding the Western tradition, but also coming up with creative ways to highlight things and be innovative and, and continue to grow the space that you're in. So I want to commend you on all of that. Uh, also, if anyone's listening and the open position sounds like a good fit, definitely reach out to Katie. But is there anything else uh, you feel like you would like people to know in terms of what you've got going on or any exciting things coming up that you want to share? Well, I was going to say one thing. I actually don't talk about this that often, but it just popped in my head. My pageant training is like, if it pops into your head, it kind of comes into your head for a reason. But I feel like someone might listen to this, like thinking back to everything we said and being like, oh, well, you were predestined for this, all this stuff. But I do want to remind you, like I didn't grow up on a farm, right? Like my dad was farming adjacent and we didn't have production herd of anything. And I never knew where I fit in. Like, you know, I remember being at Cattlemen's and they said, do you own cows? And I was like, oh, you're not supposed to ask people that. And they're like, so you don't know what you're doing. And I was yeah. like, I, I showed cows and oh, okay. So fluffy ones, you know, and you're always going to face that. I think in no matter what industry you're going to be into. And when I was younger, trying to push into like places that people, the average age was much older than me. It was super hard. And like something I never talk about is that when I was a rodeo queen, my favorite rodeo, the rodeo I'd been to every year for 14 years, um, sent me a letter and told me not to come because I wasn't a real cowgirl and that I was the worst representative of the Western way of life that I'd ever seen. Right. So I remember I wasn't super, I was sad obviously, but I wasn't super offended by that because I was like, they're promoting the West in the best that they could. And some of the reasons that they didn't like it was that I didn't wear a leather dress. I wore a fabric dress and that I rode side saddle in a parade, which they didn't like. And I, um, used social media. That was a big one. I can't believe you use social media. 
And so I just want you guys to know, like, don't like listen to all of this. And for whatever reason, feel intimidated. I don't, I feel kind of weird even saying that. Like, I hope you're inspired. And I hope you know that like, don't let people, like I said, maybe it's the entrepreneurial hate fire because how fun is it to say like, oh, I'm a 30 under 30 in the cowgirl industry. You know, I've won these awards. I speak at these events, but yet seven years ago, the people I looked up to told me I was a joke. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Yeah. I don't, I think that is such empowering advice and kind of such a, I know I've said motivating like 10,000 times in this episode, but I think it's such a motivating piece for people listening who want to get involved, but don't know how, or, I mean, I can relate to that from the aspect of, I grew up showing cattle, showing livestock. Um, we had, we did have a production uh, herd, but even now I'm not living on my family's operation. So it's that different facet of, I have six cows, but yeah, I'm involved in all of these different industry things. And people are kind of like, but you have six cows. And I'm like, yes, but that's not like, I'm here and I want to be a part of this. And so it's kind of that, I guess, internal turmoil of mm -hmm. knowing that you have a place in whatever you want to be doing, but then also kind of navigating the outer perspectives of, what's really going on so I think you said that perfectly in in how you've let it kind of guide you to where you're at and you can always make that decision of like well do you want to like I remember like carrying my shoulder my first day back I shot my first shot in the gym by myself and I was like if this goes in I'm gonna play basketball because they were like hey this is an okay time to just quit because like you've got full shoulder reconstruction like that like it's a totally fine yeah. thing and it's just really I don't know. It's just a little bit, it's just a little bit eye-opening because the thing too is like I saved money for what four years, bought three heifers. And in three years, those three heifers are now 15 cows. Mm -hmm. And you know, like it just really can change fast. And uh, oh my gosh, I bought two horses in auctions and now I have three horse or I'm gonna have four horses here soon, and I have them going off to the racetrack to be race horses because I'm like, why not be that person too? I genuinely literally chase my dreams. And I remember like someone made a joke at me. I think it was actually meant to be an insult that was like, Katie just bets on herself and it's just so funny. And I was like, yeah, walked onto a basketball team, got a full ride, became Miss Rodeo Oregon. <laughs> like, why not? Like, why not yeah. bet on yourself? And um, the other thing too, is there's a lot of great entrepreneurs out there. So if you yourself are not super confident in being an entrepreneur, like I've actually started building like my team with uh, my executive assistant and um, another subcontractor of people who are pretty like-minded, but for just whatever reason, they're like, I don't want to go start something new, but having them buy into the culture has been so fun. And I know they enjoy it. Like they love getting to go to all the events. Hope so. I'm going to like text me after this and be like, no, no, it's okay. but they, you know, like having this great energy and the fact that we can pivot, like if something isn't fulfilling us, we can just change or add something new. Uh, and go from there, which is how like some of our digital courses or some of our clients even came on was that we were like, we want to do something at the NFR. So if you guys are at the NFR and come to the Benny Benny Bucking Horse sale, we work with the United Bucking Horse Association. So we'll be doing the sale there. So there's always something fun you can add in and do. Well, Katie, I love it. And I've loved getting to chat with you and kind of learn more about all the stuff you have going on. If someone is wanting to connect with you after this, what is a good way for them to do so? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on the show. Like I said, I warned her before, I was like, I'm going to be so long winded. So just like pat your head and tell me, but she never gave me the, you know, the silent, <laughs> like the music never started playing. So guess we didn't do too bad, but um, I will give a plug for you guys. If you guys haven't done so yet and you're listening to this, make sure you follow them on social media, Ag Chicks, and then also jump on wherever you listen to podcasts and leave them a podcast review. You guys have no idea how much that actually helps podcasts out there. So please jump in and do that. And then if you want to connect with me, my handle on everything, uh, including like the domain for like my personal website is KTSCHR0CK. If you cannot guess what my basketball number is, well, it's right there for you. And uh, you can follow my podcast at That Western Life. And like I said, we don't really have a Western Insights Media social presence outside of LinkedIn. We do have a Facebook page, but we do have the website. So feel free to check out the website. And as always, I know I'm a little bit busy, um, but I love working with the next generation. So if you guys have any questions or anything like that, shoot me a DM. If there's a bunch of people who are interested, maybe we can set up a group zoom call and get some of my friends to jump on. Um, and we can answer some of those questions for you. 
Uh, well, first of all, thank you for giving me a shout out. And Katie is so right. Reviews do help uh, with whatever podcast you're listening to. It really does help. So uh, it's a great, easy, free way to support whatever shows that you like. Um, but please reach out to Katie if you have any questions. She is a fantastic resource. And I just want to congratulate you on all of the amazing things that you have going on. And I can't wait to see you continue to uh, bet on yourself and I'm saying it in a compliment not an insult I love it. <laughs> well thank you so much thank you thanks so much for tuning into this episode of ag chicks don't forget to follow along on social media at ag chicks for more agricultural related content and also be sure to check out your favorite podcast gear from www.agchicks.net we'll see you next time